year. So Dave, this is the Salmon River Canyon. That's what's called the main salmon. That river has come a long way. Um, and people raft it on like an eight day trip that goes right through the middle of the Babylon. Um, so it's a great rafting river. Dave, so different people have mapped here. Warren Hamilton did the first work in the 60s. Dave Blake did the work in terms of uh, mid, to early, mid 80s to early 90s. And this is crazy country to map. What he would do is get dropped off the top of the day and he would work his way down. Because the only way to do that, and he said a couple times he would get boxed out. And then he couldn't go up, couldn't go down. So you have to go sideways until you find the way down. So it was crazy mapping. He did a great job um, doing that. So anyway, that's where we are in space. And so again, we're going to transect out. We're going to go one further step into North America, and then we're going to come back out. But now we need to figure out where we are in time. So do we have a second one? In time, we have to talk about like the history of what's going on. The rocks here, well, it turns out it's kind of tricky, the rocks here. These rocks, these striped rocks, these are were originally granite rocks that have become metamorphosed and deformed and have become the Western Idaho Shear Zone. These rocks are about 115, 105, 100 million years, to about that age. These rocks did not exist at all when all of that stuff for the wet, for the Salmon River Belt, all those thrust faults we talked about was happening, these rocks did not exist, right? These rocks are younger. And in fact, the entire Western Idaho Shear Zone is younger. It's not the same feature as those thrust faults out there. The thrust faults moved, stopped, they were done, and then the granites intruded, and then those granites get deformed by the Western Idaho Shear Zone. So in time, it's a different story. And that has been a major confusion here. Okay, we have a car, so please get out one way or the other, and they're gonna wonder what in the world is going on. <laughs> That'd be great. The pizza box thrusting, we know that age because of the garnets that grew in that age and grew during that time. It starts at 144 and it ends, depends on who you talk to, but probably 120. So it's a short, it's a, about a 25 million year event at that time. And so it's, it's over and done. And again, that's the problem in this zone, is you have two things that are separated in time but in the same space. And it's been hard to sort of tease those out into what, what happened. Um, okay, so then going through in time. So now I'm just going to tell you the story, the whole story of what happened from beginning to end. And then you can put yourself in time in the same way you put yourself in space by using a map. This is what geologists do all the time. We sort of say, where are we in time as well? And for people who aren't geologists, I mean, that's what we're really training the undergraduates to do, is to think where you are in time. When was the passive, this margin a passive margin? Great question. So the question is, when was this margin, Western United States, a passive margin? So if you, okay. The answer is in the latest Precambrian to Cambrian. If you want numbers, it's like 650 to about 500 million years ago. Australia and Antarctica were right out there, and then they pulled apart, right? And then, and then this was the edge of North America because all of that junk, the pizza boxes, come from the Pacific Basin. And they only start at 300 million years ago. The Blue Mountain terrains, which we're going to talk about, the oldest rocks we see on those are 300 million years. They start as 
ocean island arcs, things like the Marianas Trench, like Japan, sort of, but Japan is continental material, so it's like Japan, but offshore from Japan. So things that you usually can't ever see above water, we actually get exposed. So those are island arcs. And so that's what these two things were. There were two of them. One was Balawa, that was way out there, it has no continental signature. Then there's Olds Ferry, which is a little bit North America, a little bit oceanic, so it's some <laughs> kind of, it was probably sitting outboard, it was probably sort of sitting <clears throat> Oregon coast type location. It was always pretty close to North America, whereas Wallawa was out there. Those two things collide with each other at some point in the Jurassic. So that's, okay, let's say 200 million years ago in round numbers. Then all of that gloms on to North America. That's the suture. We don't know when that happened. There's two good arguments. They have good data that support them, and it's hard to tell when it happened. It either happened in the early, Crete early Jurassic or in the late Jurassic. And it's the, the, again, it's different data sets are telling you which it is. So that gloms on. And then the pizza boxes happen. So that's 144. So that's early Cretaceous. Then the granites come in and then they get deformed. And we know exactly when that happened. That happened at 100 million years. 98, 99, 100. It's something right in there. So those happen, and then that stops at 85. That's, it's just totally done at 85. We can't find anything that's younger than that. Then, just to keep going with that, we don't really know much that happens out here, except that the Idaho Baffles, so everything from here to the Montana border, basically intrudes. All of that is new, it all intrudes to North America. There's no Idaho baffle that intrudes oceanic <coughs> material. It's all North America. Then the Columbia River basalts come out. We'll talk more about them later. And then they get tilted because there's basically now normal faulting. So basically this part of North America is, um, is the edge of where it starts. But from here on out to the west, it's all extension for 100 kilometers. So it's basically come, it's coming apart at the seam. And that all starts in the Miocene, um, and it's related, it's about 18 million years, and it's associated with the um, San Andreas systems, because the San Andreas system starts at 18 or 19 million years. Okay, so that's, that's just like the, the very rough chronology of what's going on. So I'm going to stop there for just a question. Ellen. What are those pizza boxes? Ah. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> Exactly. So this is the pepperoni, this is okay. colic mountain plate, then right. yeah, mushrooms, right. and then this is the vegetarian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you. you mentioned uh, episodes of, of granitic intrusion twice. Yes. Okay. okay, there's two episodes of granitic intrusion. One is this early Cretaceous. And then one is the late Cretaceous. And we separate them because they are very different in what they look like. The early Cretaceous are clearly an arc. They look everything like a magmatic arc. The Idaho Batholith has always been a bit of a mystery. It does not look like an arc. In fact, I think it's a plateau. I think it's a Puna Plateau, Tibetan Plateau kind of. You find exactly that kind of magmatism. It's melting North America. And so as a result of that, it has a lot of, if you, if you melt a continental rock, you get a lot of particular elements. We're just going to worry about one of them, which is potassium. And if you melt things that have potassium, you have to have a mineral that has potassium, and that's the case bar. So the, all, everything, in the, everything in the Idaho Batholith is a two mica granite. It's got biotite, yes, but it also has white mica, muscovite. And you're melting North America. It has garnet. It's got all those goodies that uh, continental crust has. So that's why the two things. What's a batholith? Uh, a batholith is just a large mapped exposure of a granitic rock. So the Sierra Nevada batholith, the Idaho <coughs> batholith. What's exposed? It's what's exposed at the surface. Okay. Nick, go ahead. 
So we're at this outcrop. Maybe I'm jumping the gun. No, no, we've jump. We've got all these vertical stripes in the bedrock, and then we've got some light squirts that are diagonal, mm -hmm. and maybe some dark-looking squirts as well. Mm -hmm. So what at this out? Can you help us see what this outcrop is saying to us, and what parts of your story does this fit into? All right, Dick's pushing me to the, to the, and that's <laughs> that why, to the regular. So this, if you look above and you're looking at this fabric like this, it's, it's like a series of pages that are coming out at you, and you're looking only at the edge of the page. And if you looked on top, you would see a horizontal stripe, and that's a foliation, or a like a folia, like a Shakespeare folia, or a philodo, it's all the same root, they're just pages, or leaves, foliation, right? They're all telling you that it's in like this, and that is because the granites get smashed, and they get smashed so that the minerals align themselves. And in fact, the whole rock starts to segregate, and you get white bands and dark bands. And that's because of this smashing effect, and that's all the Western Idaho shear zone fabric. They formed vertically. They didn't. They formed. They, there was no fabric in this when they <coughs> intruded as a granite, and then the Western Idaho shear zone comes in and smashes everything. Okay, so, so the foliation just happened that way. It the foliation happened that way. Okay. Exactly. So it's not a sedimentary that's been tipped. That's correct. It's not sedimentary that was tipped. This was an igneous rock with very little fabric that gets so smashed then it forms like this. So just to give you an idea, when we make the estimates, this zone is about five kilometers wide. Now, was that, three miles? Mm -hmm. This zone used to be about 10 times that. Oh. And wow. all of this stuff gets smashed into this little zone. So it takes like the entire, what looked like the Sierra Nevada, if you've ever driven across it on I-80, and you smash it into the three miles, that's what the Western Idaho Shear Zone is. Okay. It is an extraordinary <laughs> deformation. And it's not only smashing, at the same time it's smashing, the, it's basically right lateral, which is to say, stuff by Riggins is moving way north. So, the stuff that we see by Riggins was not here with respect to North America. It was at least as far south as Snowbank, which is where we're going tomorrow, which you'll see is a long way away, but it probably was in southern Idaho. The Riggins group was not there when it smashed into North America, right? It has moved north, and a lot north, on this zone. So th this was a magmatic arc, these granites. Uh, do we have any sense of the polarity of the subduction zone that uh, formed these? <laughs> Great question. So this is an arc, so they had to have a subduction zone. So was the subduction zone from the Pacific going under North America, or could there have been a North American that go in underneath. We think it has to be from the Pacific Plate this way because there's nothing that, there's no sutures, there's no blue schists, there's no ultramafics that would be associated with a subduction zone anywhere in the Montana, and we can see the rocks, right? So we're pretty sure that it had to be this way. So there's no blue schist that way. There's no blue schist that way. There's plenty of stuff that way. Unfortunately, there's basalts. <laughs> and a lot of them, so you, it's hard to know. So, but that way is the Idaho Batholith, so could they have been destroyed by the Idaho Batholith? Great question. So could they have been destroyed? And so the argument is because we get these little bits and screens that look like Windermere group equivalents, yeah. that we see the trital zircons that look just like the ones down in Utah or just like the ones in Canada, that this belt would have been continuous. That makes sense? Yeah. All right. Do these granites under these stresses allow for any lubricity of the motion of what's to our west? So the, uh, so the question is, how much does it matter that the granites are letting things slide in some sense? And the, and the answer is yes, because granites are really weak when they're melt or a magma, but they're really strong once they solidify. So if you can deform them when they're magmas, it's really easy to deform. It's much easier to deform a magma than a solid rock, right? So that's the argument, is that, in fact, it's putting all the deformation into the arc for a very, for because of that reason. All right, so I'm going to channel my inner Nick here.
The other things that are going on here are twofold. There are white lines that are going here, but they're kind of squiggly, right? So those are folds. They're, what those are were originally planar, uh, tabular, like a book, dikes that come in, because that's how dikes intrude. And then there's just enough deformation left that they start to fold. And what you'll see is if you take the two limbs of that, or what's called the axial plane of the fold, it's parallel to the stripes underneath it, right? So the axial plane is parallel to that foliation for all of them, for this one, for this one. If you get them, however, if you intrude them into this direction, and you're squeezing the arc horizontally, but stretching it vertically, they will go into little sausage-like things that are called boudins, which is a French word for a particular kind of sausage. You can get in New Orleans if you really want it. And so that's boudinage. And so these things tell you they're light, but they're still involved in the deformation. And then there, and then there's this, if you look at this, it's kind of weird. It's kind of a brownish red thing. Yeah. And so that is a lamprophere. I am a little bitter about this lamprophere because I lot of to bet to read Lewis about this. He said it was going to be Eocene. I said it was going to be Miocene. He was right. So it's an Eocene <laughs> lamprophere. The reason it looks so weird, right? Because it goes way up there, then way down here, then way up and down. You lose it here completely, and then you pick it up there. It's because it's about a half meter wide, but oriented perfectly parallel to this face, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so it's plastered behind that. If you're down, I don't know anybody's names, but anyway, if you get down there, what's your name? Annette. If you get down where Annette is and you look this way, you realize it's actually just a plainer thing, mm -hmm. right? It's just mm -hmm. this weird visual effect. And so that means the Western Irish Shears is completely done by the Eocene, which we know. Um, what's cool about this Lamprophere is there's these, they're just weird, they're light, they have big biotites in them. You can see yeah. individual biotites, so mm -hmm. they're kind of cool to look at. Um, so I think that's all I have to say about them. We don't understand why, but there's a whole bunch of Eocene Lamprophere. Oh, it sounds like a car. Oh. If anybody car. wants to see the biotite. Car, car. So there's a, I've got a piece of, it's it's a piece of the biotype. Yeah. Oh, excellent. All right, well, so Ellen again has come to the rescue. If you look on figure 18, there's a picture of the lamp here, and you, it's how it's outlined, so that might help you on this space. The composition of it. Yeah, composition of lampropheres. Uh, weird. Um, <laughs> they're like, they're mafic rocks that contain biotite, which is kind of strange. Um, I don't think I'm going to help you more than about that. Um, they're, they're, we don't quite get lampropheres. I don't quite get lampropheres. That's how I should say that. Nick. So can you summarize in numbers millions of years ago, the age of the granite here? And then the age of the smashing, it's only two main chapters from this outcrop. Okay, so from this exact outcrop, I don't have a uranium lead zircon age, which is how we know the age of the granites, but it's going to be something like 110 million years old, and it just was totally happy. And then the, the smashing starts at 100, and it's mostly over here by about 90, but it dribbles on to 85. And the dribbling goes, as it turns out, east. So, and the reason is the magmatism goes east. And so there's a unit that's going to be in here, we'll see it tomorrow, called the Payette River Tonalite. It's all the way from Orofino all the way to southern Idaho. And it always comes in at 91, and it's everywhere along the shear zone. So what gets sheared varies in the shear zone. Sometimes it's granite, sometimes it's wall rock. It depends, but there's always the Payette River Tone Light. It's always there. Um, wall rock was originally what? Uh, again, it depends where you are. Here in Riggins, it's actually a combination of granite and this weird Windermere stuff. Oh, okay, so it's a straight 
if there's some craton <coughs> sediments mixed in. Most other places, it's just or it's just granite. Okay, we have another car. Yes. Right. Looks like you have a petrified albino rattlesnake right above your head. <laughs> I'm a little worried about that. <laughs> yep. So, the, 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 the smashing is related to a subduction zone that's somewhere to the west, right? That, that's, that's causing this major stress. Um, and, uh, um, but yet, this is not representative of a, of a volcanic arc here, but that helps generate the, the, uh, the heat flow to cause the melting. Okay, so this, we have a really good question yeah. here, and it's a complicated one. <laughs> so this has to be an arc, because we have granites of that arc composition. Therefore, the smashing must be related to the subduction. That's what's not true, because okay. you have a subduction zone, but then what's happening is that the subduction goes, goes, my elbow is the insular terrain. Eventually, you get the insular terrain. Okay, so the smashing is the insular terrain, but the slab is still going down. Yeah. So you get the combination of a collision plus that sort of remains of a subduction zone, which produces granites for like another 10 million years. Mm -hmm. So that's why, that's why it's complicated. So my, people have not really known what to do with it because it doesn't make sense, right? That we have the shallow slab model in California, but it doesn't work here at all because first of all, it's supposed to be 85, this is 100. And it doesn't work because you can't have a shallow slab if you've got the magmatism happening right at the edge of the North America, right? So none of that works. It works perfectly well with an insular terrain collision. Yes? Is the tunnel light the stitching pluton? Yes, you can think about the total light as a stitching pluton. The total light is locally deformed on its edges, but yes, it is basically what stitches North America to the accreted terrains. So once that comes in, the thing stops moving independently, and then they start moving together. So that's going to get to another phase. Like when that cools, and it's like glue, it holds the Blue Mountains to North America, then the system has to break into a new, whole new way of deforming, and that's when you start getting the rotations. Okay? So as soon as the granite cools and stitches, glues the thing together, then weird stuff starts to happen. So all those grottoms were formed? Car. Okay, we have a car. So I'm going to answer that question. The grobbins are all young. The grobbins all affect the Columbia River basalt and therefore must be younger than the Columbia River basalt. Is this the insular? Mm -hmm. Are we looking at the insular? No, you are looking at what was north, what was an arc that was right on the edge of North America that's getting smashed. So All right, I'm not sure about the time and location. I'm thinking it's completely not relevant here, but I just wondered if there's any factor of the clockwork rotation going on. The clockwise rotation does not start until 85. So in other words, the shear zone has to shut down because it stitches and then other things, then that clockwise rotation starts. So that's, the, so that's. But that's also, that's also further west of here, no, I think. This, this area rotated. So okay. I think this fabric, this western, oh, okay. Now Ellen's keeping Ellen me honest. <laughs> so the, I think the whiz did not happen in a north-south in this orientation. It happened in this orientation. And then the whole mass has been rotated. So the western outer shear zone is like this, and it's like that because it's on the old ridge transform system inherited from the Precambrian because we know that we have Windermere sediments right up against it. And everywhere else on the entire, as you go from Yukon down to California, mm -hmm. everything else, all the other transforms are like this, except Idaho gets yanked out in a weird orientation. Okay, so, that, so that's why. Um, and so what happens is after 85, and after you put in the tonalite sill, because the paleomag's on the tonalite sill, that tonalite sill has to rotate 30 degrees 
the structure that does it is the Lewis and Clark line, and then it freezes. Okay, so the times are 100, that's insular collision. 85 is when you switch from smashing the arc, so that's the hit phase, into the run phase as the insular moves up the coast. Car. The car. <laughs> All right, and then 55 is when the whole system stops shortening. We, and that's a play motion thing, that, that there's nothing driving it in. So 55 it stops, and then the last age that matters is 18, because at 18, the whole system starts to extend and we get strike flips in California. And they're related, but I'm not gonna go into that right now. So the, um, the rotation, I, I think the polar rotation is someplace around Orofino, is that right? <clears throat> okay. Y yes, for the 18 million years to present rotation, oh. but not for the 85 to 55 oh. rotation. There's different <clears throat> poles for different times. I see. So that one, is it in the corner and it's rotating like this, or is it in the center and rotating? Like so, so is Montana going south? <laughs> Unbelievably, Montana's going slightly south at the moment. Uh -huh. If you look at the GPS, it's really small, but it's slightly south. Washington's going north. Southern Idaho is going west. Northern Idaho is going east. It's like a swirl. Where's the center of rotation? And the center of rotation is Orofino because it's, it's right there because it's, it's where the Blue Mountains rotate. Yep. Everything's stuck, but that's the 18 million year to present rotation. It's not the older rotation. And it's Orofino because of the Lewis and Clark? It's Oro... No, it, Lewis and Clark is to the north. Oh. Or, right, it's up here. And Lewis and Clark line is important till 55, and it's actually important till 50, but that's a, a different reason. Mm -hmm. that That's what's allowing this whole block of Idaho to move in. But... What's, what's rotating, Idaho is sort of, is basically stable. What's really rotating is the Blue Mountains, mm. which are pivoting on Orofino and moving clockwise. Before, that's the 80 million year to present. For the 85 to 55 rotation, it's all the Blue Mountains and Idaho are rotating. Yeah. So different things, they're, they're grouping differently as they rotate, which is, I know is confusing. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to stop us. Let's actually just look at this rock for a little bit. Uh, so you can look at the 110 stuff that's deformed. These dikes are probably like 92 because they're just a little deformed. And then we have this 48 more or less, I can't remember the exact number, Lamperphere, which is post-dating everything. All right, so let's just have a quick look at rocks. We're going to try and get out the off-crop by, what time is it? Can you explain the term living? Yeah, so I'm happy to chat with anybody. We'll get off the outcrop in about 25 minutes. got a question back here on the back. Yep, right. Yeah, okay, so you, you're welcome to look at the rock. When you have a foliation, so when the minerals in these granites align, they form planes, yes, foliations, but they can also form lines, like my fingers as lineations. And so the, if the minerals align, and those lineations here are vertical. And, and if you want to see one, Ellen's got one here. If you want to go see what a lineation looks like. I also have a biotite on the lamprophere. Okay, if great. And there's a lamprophere biotite if one wants to take a peek. So just look at this. If you go down a little bit this way, you can see red garnets, too, that are growing in this zone. This is your foliation. Right. So your oh, foliation yeah. is always going to be on this plane of your foliation, but it can be oriented in different ways. So the foliation, so this is the foliation, so you look at the lineation on this plane. That's like normal to the foliation. And you can see, it's, it's a little hard to make out. These aren't great rocks for looking at the lineation, but there is, like you can see, you can see like these, you might have to get close. There's some like biotypes that align like this. And because we're in a transpressional area, you're getting not only swishing of this way, 
but you're also getting the shearing, but it's all getting squished up. And that's how we know it's a transpressional is because you have delineations like this. If you only had the shearing, your direction of elongation would be this way, and so your lineations would be like this. And so that's how we can actually tell some of That's how we're coming to that conclusion of transpression. Is that what they call a felsic? Uh, yeah, this looks... So all this white stuff, I was thinking it was marble. That's uh, yeah, uh, this is, yeah, this isn't marble here. This is a lot of these felsic intrusions. Um, and so I think these are pretty similar age to the um, rest of this So it says there's epidote in there. Uh, yeah, we'd have to look pretty carefully. I should grab my hand lens or something or, like, get a fresh piece. But, yeah, you'd have to look. It's a really good picture in, in the Idaho uh, uh, yeah, field. Yeah, there might yeah, but, yeah, be some, there might be some mineralization on textbook examples. <laughs> That's it. This is the lamp repair. Yeah. You're, you're referring to a different form of the lamp. Uh, this is oh, the, the epidotes in, yeah. in the futon. It's not, it's, it's no, not this No, this stuff. is, yeah, this okay. is, a, so I, I, it's a similar composition little, as some of this stuff. You just don't have, like, your biotites and your horn blends and stuff like this. It's going to be a lot of quartz and feldspar. There's some biotite in here. Um, when you're getting a marble, 